Hello, and welcome to Civic Saturday. I'm Janae Kane, co-founder of Citizen University. Civic Saturday is a civic analog to a faith gathering, but it's not about an unquestioning faith in America, rather a wide-eyed purposeful faith that democracy and the promise of liberty and justice for all happens because we make it happen. And if that's the case, it takes us coming together in places like this and other civic gatherings in groups big and small to build up our civic muscles together, to instill a faith in ourselves and in each other. Today, you might notice that someone is missing. I will be hosting without my co-founder and husband, Eric Liu, as he takes time to pause, rest, and grieve the loss of his mother, Julia, who died earlier this week. Eric and our family are being held with such love and tenderness during this time of sadness. In addition to our close friends, our extended Citizen University family has shown up in so many ways. When we started Civic Saturday five years ago, we quickly realized that we'd be forever surrounded by loving people living their lives for the good of others. And we're so lucky to be the recipients of that goodness now. And so to honor Julia's courage and boundless curiosity, I dedicate this very special edition of Civic Saturday to Julia Liu. Today, we are lucky to welcome three Civic Saturday fellows from across the country to share their special civic sermons with us. As always, we'll also have a chance to meet each other in small groups for conversation, listen to live music, be inspired by civic scripture, and ponder a selection of civic poetry. But first, I know I need this and I'd like to share it with you. Let's take a moment for all of us to pause and to reset our mind-body connection. For over a year now, our nervous system has been on high alert and it's exhausting. So let's take a moment to send our parasympathetic nervous system the message that there is no current threat and that we can invite ourselves to find the calm, creative, present moment that is now. Now, if you're not used to doing these kinds of things, just trust me, uh, just stick with it, lean into your curiosity and see what happens. I'd like to ask you to please put your feet firmly on the floor and press down. This is gonna trick your brain to registering that you are in balance and that you are safe. Now, close your eyes if you'd like. Place a hand on your heart and on your belly if that feels good. We're going to play a mantra written and sung by my dear friend and yogi, Claudette Evans, as we breathe together for the next few minutes. So let's begin by letting out a long exhale and inhale, and just continue breathing with your feet pressing into the floor as you listen. I am love, I'm a portal, I'm connection, I am love, I am love, I am knowing, I am wisdom, I am love. I am love, I am clarity, I am truth, I am love, I am love, I am kindness, I'm compassion, I am love, I am love, I am boundless, I am fearless, I am love. I am love, I am passion, I'm creation, I am love. I am love, I am strong, I am steadfast, I am love. I am love, I'm a vessel, a 
of expression. I am love. I am love. I am strong. I am steadfast. I am love. I am love. I am passion. I am creation. I am love. I am love. I am boundless. I am fearless. I am love. I am love. I am kindness. I am compassion. I am love. I am love. I am clarity. I am truth. I am love. I am love. I am knowing. I am wisdom. I am love. I am love. I'm a portal. I'm connection. I am love. I am love. I am knowing. I am wisdom. I am love. I am love. I am clarity. I am truth. I am love. I am love. I am kindness. I'm compassion. I am love. Mm, thank you so much. Let's let out one more exhale all together. Big thanks to my friend Claudette. Now, let's meet our very special Civic Saturday fellows. Martha Flores, Mike C, and Mijan Tobias. Martha? Hi, everybody. My name is Martha Flores. I am a Cohort 9 Civic Saturday Fellow, and I am in Modesto, California. Hi, everybody. My name is Mike C, and I am in Austin, Texas, and I am part of Civic 6. Thank you, Mike. And now, Mijan? I'm Mijan, Mijan Sali, and I'm in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and I'm part of Cohort 9. Thank you all, and I look forward to hearing from you later. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our Civic Saturday musician for today, Kira Wilkinson. Share a song with us. Kira? Thank you. <clears throat>
this is my bandmate. <laughs> Thank you, Kier, and welcome to your bandmate. It's always fun to have uh, our young ones pop in and join us. Uh, now it's time for what we call civic scripture. And civic scripture are special civic texts from across the spectrum of American history and ideas um, that help give us shared perspective to think about and connect to our current moment. So we're gonna invite um, one of our Civic Saturday community members who volunteered to read for us today. And I'd like to introduce our reader, Martin Pierre-Louis. This piece is from Dan Rather, an excerpt from his book, What Unites Us. As we seek common ground with our fellow citizens, we cannot forsake our core values. Compromise cannot be confused with capitulation. Recently, many of you have come up to me and asked, what can or should we do in a country we no longer recognize? I have suggested, and we'll do so again here, that we all reach down deep into the soul of this nation and hold on to the central principles that have made us great. Do not let go. Do not apologize or explain away your brand of patriotism. Do not sacrifice your ideals. I understand that my time to shape and help this world is passing. This is the circle of life. I hope now to inspire others to love this country, to pledge to work hard, and ultimately to make it a healthier and more just place to live. I ultimately have faith in the basic decency of our American citizenry and indeed people around the globe. I believe strongly that the core tenets I love most about this nation can be a foundation for commonality and strength once more. I believe in a wide and expansive vision of our national identity. And I believe in all of you to make it a reality. Courage. Thank you, Martine. Courage. That was written in 2017. And uh, we continue to draw on and to deepen our courage. Thank you. Now it's time to hear our three civic sermons. And we're going to hear them one after the other. Please listen closely to each one. And then in between, we'll take a short pause for you to jot down a few thoughts and ideas that stuck with you. We can use these notes when we meet later in our civic circles. So it's now my pleasure to introduce Martha Flores. Twelve months ago, I would have never imagined I'd be sharing a virtual platform with such inspirational people like Eric, Janae, Mijan, and Mike. I could not imagine using my voice to talk about civics to a room of strangers. Yet, although you may not know me and I may not know you, we are familiar to each other in our spirit. So allow me to introduce myself. Mi nombre es Marta Flores. I was born and raised in El Paso, Texas. And for the last 11 years, I have made California my home. I am a first generation American, daughter of Mexican immigrants. Although I am American by birth, I am a born again citizen, rediscovering my civic faith over the course of the last eight months. Eight months is not a very long time. 
Up until then, I considered myself an interested bystander. I cared enough to watch, but I lacked motivation to jump into the civic space. I did not realize the important role I have to play that each and every single one of us plays in making democracy work. The image of we as a democracy will never be complete without each one of us seeing ourselves as part of the final picture. I want to tell you about my journey to discovering we by sharing three things that combined, I believe can inspire other interested bystanders to become active in democracy, community, opportunity, and courage. First, there is community. Over the last decade, I have lived in four different cities. And while I have a strong affection for each one of those places, Modesto is where I have first felt the essence of community. I found a job that I love as program officer at Stanislaus Community Foundation. By working at an organization focused on the lives of local residents, I have a unique view on the complex mechanisms required to make community work for everyone. Within this complexity though, lies a simple truth. Genuine curiosity about other people goes a long way in our effort to build lasting relationships. Some of my strongest personal relationships are with individuals of opposite political beliefs because we know each other's story. Let's be steadfast in our empathy for others. Let's choose to see the heart first. Second, there is opportunity. Opportunity is peculiar. America is known as the land of opportunity, yet for many, it feels so hard to grasp. Some create their own opportunities, others inherit them. But no matter how we come to them, an opportunity won't be an opportunity if we don't recognize it as such. I want to share a fact about myself that you may find surprising. I have no formal background in civics or in writing or in public speaking. But eight months ago, my boss told me about Citizen University and encouraged me to apply to the Civic Saturday Fellowship. I could have easily said no based on my perceived lack of qualifications, but I recognized it provides a space for curiosity it fits with my core values. It energizes me to want to do more. This was my moment, which brings me to my final point. Courage. Courage is a choice. When first presented with the opportunity to, be, to apply for the fellowship, I was scared, not about being rejected, but being accepted. What if I didn't measure up? How would I find the time? I was reminded though, I had my community. This was my opportunity. I just needed to say yes. Yes to stepping out of my comfort zone. Yes to challenging my potential. I chose to say yes. And now eight months into my fellowship, I have hosted two successful Civic Saturdays in Stanislaus County. By saying yes, I have had the wonderful experience of meeting new people like Lang Power, who just completed Civic Seminary and will be part of Cohort 10 and join me in building this movement locally. I can attest that if we act with courage in those circumstances that challenge us, we will gain new relationships and new hope for what is possible. My message to interested bystanders out there is this. I understand you and I urge you that the time to be an active member of democracy is now as we collectively grieve the nearly 600,000 deaths from coronavirus in the US alone. As we face the aftermath of a twice impeached president who incited an insurrection as our brothers and sisters are targeted for their race and senselessly murdered. To repair, we must start with our communities, 
we must recognize opportunities before us to act. And ultimately, each one of us must make the choice to say yes. Throughout my fellowship with Citizen University, I have explored the equation, power plus character equals citizenship. And today I propose a new one, community plus opportunity plus courage equals we. from Mike C. It's the past we step into and how we repair it. Today, like my co-speakers, I would like to reflect on courage. The line from Miss Gorman's beautiful poem suggests that our past is something to repair. And the only way to repair it is to step back into history, to step back into our personal stories, and to step back into the history that we share as a nation. To do both requires a great deal of courage. It requires even more courage when we step back into the past with someone who has a different view about our shared history. But having the courage to do that is how repairs get made. Personally, I grew up in a Texas suburban neighborhood that was probably 95% white. I grew up immersed in a culture where racism wasn't something that you really thought that much about. It was something that you did. Something you did casually, without a second thought. Unfortunately, I admit today that I was not just an observer of this racism, but also sometimes a participant. My views have thankfully changed a lot since then. And I find myself preferring to look forward instead of backwards. I love to work with others to make this world a better place. There's so much good work that we can do together to achieve greater equity in our country. And it's very tempting to simply not look back at my own thoughtless, sometimes shameful past. But as Ms. Gorman reminds us in her poem, sometimes that is what we must do. A few years ago, I had the privilege of participating in a two-day seminar on race called Beyond Diversity. And at that seminar, I was paired with a black woman to have a conversation about our personal histories. And after I awkwardly stumbled through an explanation of my upbringing, she asked me one question. She asked, what would people have thought if you had dated a black girl? I could see in her eyes that she asked entirely out of curiosity. It was clear to me that she wanted to learn about a culture that she had never experienced. She asked her question without judgment. She asked her question not to prove a point, but to learn what I had lived. And honestly, I didn't have an answer for her. The question itself threw me. For me, dating outside of my race while I was growing up just would not have happened for me. I feel that that answer was perhaps more heartbreaking to both of us than if I had said that I would have been ostracized. But still, she listened. She did not let on whether she judged me or how she judged me or how she judged the people I grew up with and loved. And because of that, we both learned something that day. Our world was a little more repaired. It took me some courage to engage in that conversation back then, just as it takes me some courage to tell you that story right now. But do you know what actually took more courage? For her to ask the question, for her to ask the question not knowing what my answer would be, for her to ask the question knowing that my answer could be something that she did not want to hear, for her to ask the question knowing that I might respond with anger or resistance, and even more for her to ask the question, listen, carefully to my answer and encourage me to speak more about it without shame. To repair our country, we each need to step into our past with courage, but we also need to step into our 
past while encouraging others to join us, particularly those of us that may be hesitant to reopen old wounds. Until I worked on this reflection, I never really thought about where the word encourage comes from. And it means quite literally to put more courage into someone else. In order to repair our country, we need to find ways to encourage those with different experiences, those with a different view of our history, and even with a different view of where our country should be headed, to have the courage to enter into these conversations, not just about race, but about all of the issues that are important to us. In my experience, the best way to encourage people that disagree with you to, is to still join you in conversation, is to walk that fine line between authentically sharing your own unique background and ideas, while at the same time listening with interest, listening with curiosity, and with the temporary withholding of judgment to the person who has had the courage to join you in conversation. It is not the time to openly judge your partner or to tell them why they are wrong. That won't encourage your partner to continue. But at the same time, be sure to follow Dan Rather's advice. He said in the reading that we just heard, quote, do not let go. Do not apologize or explain away your brand of patriotism. If you have a different perspective than your conversation partner, by all means, please share that. But do so without stating that your view is right while theirs is wrong. If you've had the courage to enter the conversation with openness and curiosity, you also have the courage to honor your partner with the assumption that they will have the courage to listen to you too. I learned this just recently. Through most of the last 20 years, I was quite comfortable living in my progressive Austin bubble. I generally only talked politics with progressive people that I knew agreed with me. But my recent volunteer work with Braver Angels has taught me the value of talking with people that don't agree with me. I've had many great conversations and I made a lot of new friends. In preparation for today, I did a little experiment. I shared Ms. Gorman's poem with some of my conservative friends that I've met through Braver Angels. And I asked them what they thought about when they hear those lines. And I'd like to share with you what my conservative friend Amber shared with me. And I believe Amber is with us today. In response to Ms. Gorman's line, being American is more than a pride we inherit. Amber asks, what did we inherit? She continues, we did not inherit a country to scoff at, to raise a fist at and say, you let us down. Instead, we inherit a country to cherish, to embrace and say, you are still becoming. Amber continues, every day offers us a chance to ask a question rather than to condemn an opinion, to find common ground rather than a common enemy. Amber sees our past as both, quote, proud and painful, and she shares that she has the hope that if we work together, America can be as beautiful to all as America is to her. I know from firsthand knowledge that Amber and many others on both sides of our political divide have the courage and the willingness to do this work together. To repair our past, we must revisit it. To revisit our past takes courage, particularly to revisit our past with those with a different viewpoint. But together, we must find that courage and we must encourage others to join us as well by listening with curiosity and compassion, even when we disagree. Let's hear from Mijan Sally Tobias. Mijan. Thank you, Jenna. And thank you everyone dearly for your presence today, not just for making this gathering space to include me, but for your presence as I share a story about the power of black, indigenous and women of color leaders who build this ancestral Tewa land that I get to call home. 
Please know before I get too far though, ahead of myself, I'm Jeroge and Elizabeth's daughter. And even though I'm a Quaker, I come from the black church and I'm about to testify. So I'm going to ask you to drop in the chat one or say it or whatever it is, um, something that I share touches your heart. As we sit in this moment today, I wanna to share three things with you. One, the story of my home, and two very important phone calls that I made to kinfolk this past year. But first, home, New Mexico, a majority minority state composed of a self-identified gender majority of women and girls, a place where 77% of our households are led by these elder and young women. However, for quite some time, New Mexico has been considered tricultural, and every time that that term has been used, tricultural, it has consciously or unconsciously invisibilized and silenced two other predominant groups who live, who love, who labor, who lead, and who grow New Mexico into home. Those two groups that I'm talking about are Black folks and API folks. And I'm here to tell you that Black women and femmes and API women and femmes are here we belong here and we've been here for some time. This invisibilization and myth of the triculture is what led me to do the work of community and relationship building with women of color nonprofit leaders in the spring of 2016. As a black woman executive director of a cultural arts organization in Northern New Mexico, I found myself overwhelmed and completely burnt out. My cultural building and leadership work those weren't the contributors to my burnout and harm though. It was my isolation, being the only one in boardrooms, the only one in philanthropic foundation spaces and collaborator meetings. It was so exhausting that I left. But now I see the last six years as a mixed blessing, especially 2020. Why? Because as hard as it all has been, in 2020, I learned that kinfolk have each other. I was, so, I was so angry before, during, and after last summer's uprisings, especially with all of the related nonprofit posturing and subsequent missteps that I had decided to leave again, but not just the container of the work. I had instead fixed my mind on leaving New Mexico altogether and possibly the country. Because in 2020 and the years that ran into it, I felt isolation in New Mexico as a black leader, as a black single mother, as a black woman, and as a black cultural worker. I was seething in my anger really, because I'm also old enough to know that the reality is even with the will to change, folks don't transform overnight. But something moved me to practice what I constantly preach. Instead of making a large decision by myself, I picked up the phone and I asked Nisi Taylor for help. I don't remember anything about what I said or what I asked. I just remember that I didn't need an appointment to call my busy friend. And I remember Nisi saying, maybe you could just stay for us. That single invitation is how I found my kinfolk within this community when I actually had not seen us in that way before. And they are how I began rebuilding my personal peace in my heart and my mind as first steps to rebuilding myself as a leader and healthy person. I can testify today with y'all because it is my attempt to honor and appreciate a particular group of black, indigenous and women of color leaders because I could not have moved forward without them. And I'm starting to notice and dare to believe that maybe some parts of them feel the exact same way about me too, that we could not have moved forward together as whole leaders without each other. Now that second call happened a few weeks after November's presidential election. I was gathered together with the black women and femme leaders in my program. And for the first time since the summer uprisings, I laughed in a group. Anyone who knows me will tell you that I am tremendously loving and joyful and that I'm always, always, always laughing and smiling every day, but that hadn't been the case in, for a long time and with good justifiable reason. In that clear space, 
right after the laughter returned to me, I had one thought. If I was so angry at the ways that Black folk had been murdered, harmed, and invisibilized over the past four centuries, and I know that root of the anger is because I descend from stolen people who labored unpaid and continue to be underpaid on this stolen land, how do in Indigenous women feel? You know, the aunties, sisters, daughters, wives, cousins, and godmamas of all of the current missing and murdered Indigenous women. When I was angry and heartbroken over the silence in my country last summer, how have Indigenous women been feeling while their loved ones continue to be slain and disappeared? So without another appointment or whatever folks are doing these days to tell someone that they wanna talk before they actually call and talk, I called up Taz, that beautiful bridge and healer of a black and indigenous woman. And I told her what I had realized and was thinking. I asked her what I was supposed to do with all of that. And that Mijan, you are a speaker. <laughs> People actually pay you to speak. They listen to you. So go on ahead and speak up. <laughs> Tell them what you just told me. The first time I retold that conversation was with a small group of indigenous women leaders here at home. The second time I'm retelling this conversation is now with each of you. I am a dignified black woman and I'm not speaking on behalf of anyone else or any professional affiliation that I have. I want you to know that I promise my ancestors would never choose the Middle Passage or hundreds of years of slavery and subsequent harm. I am not responsible for this land being stolen. However, I do recognize that I'm not indigenous to this place that I call home. I'm an appreciative visitor. I am wondering now what we may have in common with each other in the space of descending from amazing lineages of healing and tenacity. And I wanna know if you will help me invite more of us into making home. If I could tap the pulse of black indigenous and women of color leadership in New Mexico, I would say that many of us are a combination of tired from 2020 and also hopeful by pos possible positive change. But here's the thing about these particular times as I find ourselves laboring and leading towards justice, liberation, freedom, and self-shaping futures. I'm beginning to listen more carefully to the kinfolk in my community, to the things that the indigenous women leaders said to me last month as they used two words to describe me and other non-indigenous folks. These two words are our relatives. Mijan, you are our relative. Going back to that story of the larger us, the one that is beyond my personal community of relationships, for that story to become truth, I know that we have to find and relationship build with more kinfolk. In fact, it has to be communities of kinfolk, relationship building with other communities of kinfolk. Not just the kind you know through social media, but the ones you can call at 3 a.m. when you are struggling with your sobriety, or those who interrupt a Zoom work meeting with a precious ultrasound. I'm talking about the folks who help you, me, us, grieve, repair, heal, birth, rest, die, and make home. Because of my kinfolk, I was able to let my anger teach and evolve me. I've rededicated myself to my black leadership path. The kind though, where M gets to stand for Mijan and not Messiah or martyr, where I can live and thrive as a dignified leader. Yes, however, just as importantly as a whole living, nourished mother, sister, friend, and daughter. Special shout out though, any of y'all know my soulmate, please let me know. I am ready and willing to be a future loving wife too. All right, this kind of joyful leadership is where we all get to occupy space as communities where everyone is actively healing, breathing, seen, and heard. In service to that vision, I ask each of you, please continue to be and build 
your beloved communities of kinfolk and relatives. Please keep rededicating yourselves to uplifting and supporting Black, Indigenous, API, Latinx, Hispanic, and all of our women and girls of color. From that sweet spot, remember to remain committed to growing and expanding our collective, free, loving, beloved community together. The Hill We Climb by Amanda Gorman, recited at the presidential inauguration on January 20th, 2021. When day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never ending shade? The loss we carry, a sea we must wade. We've braved the belly of the beast. We've learned that quiet isn't always peace and the norms and notions of what just is, isn't always just is. And yet the dawn is ours before we knew it. Somehow we, we do it. Somehow we've weathered and witnessed a nation that isn't broken, but simply unfinished. We, the successors of a country and a time where a skinny black girl descended from slaves and raised by a single mother can dream of becoming president only to find herself reciting for one. And yes, we are far from polished, far from pristine, but that does not mean we are striving to form a union that is perfect. We are striving to forge a union with purpose to compose a country committed to our cultures, colors, characters, and conditions of man. We seek harm to none and harmony for all. Let the globe, if nothing else, say this is true, that even as we grieved, we grew, that even as we hurt, we hoped, that even as we tried, we, even as we tired, we tried, and we forever be tied together victorious, not because we will never again no defeat, but because we will never again sow division. Scripture tells us to envision that everyone shall sit under their own vine and fig tree and no one shall make them afraid. If we are to live up to our own time, then victory won't lie in the blade. But in all the bridges we've made, that is the promise to glade, the hill we climb. If only we dare. It is because being American is more than a pride we inherit. It's the past we step into and how we repair it. So let us leave behind a country better than the one we were left with. Every breath from my bronze pounded chest, we will raise this wounded world into a wondrous one. We will rise from the gold limbed hills of the West. We will rise from the windswept north, Northeast where our forefathers first realized revolution. We will rise from the lake rim cities of the Midwestern states. We will rise from that sun-baked South. We will rebuild, reconcile, and recover. And every known nook of our nation and every corner called our country, our people diverse and beautiful will emerge, battered and beautiful. When day comes, we step out of the shade, aflame and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it, for there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. Thank you, Rhonda. That was just read beautifully, I appreciate you. And thank you to Martha and Mike, Mijan, Kier and Martine for sharing yourselves and your thoughts and your ideas and your courage with us. And now it's time for us to share with each other. It's time for a very important part of Civic Saturday, our civic circles. It's time to help one another make sense of this moment we are in. It's time to engage with each other, to process and digest what we've been learning, feeling and thinking. We hope that meeting in small groups will foster connection and who knows, you might be inspired to join together in collective action for the common good. And here's the prompt. We'll also put it in chat. How or where have you seen courage show up in your community? 
And have you felt inspired to step up and join these efforts? Wow, we had such an interesting small group, uh, people from all over and um, wonderful stories and context uh, people were sharing for their lives and uh, trying to create more courage, um, which if the words that really stuck with me today from everything we've done um, and, and from those beautiful sermons, oh, thank you so much to our fellows. Um, you know, we had planned to have this sharing of the fellows um, over you know, two months ago, and I'm so thankful that we had planned that and it worked out so beautifully to give Eric time off and to give me some time off and actually to give our whole team uh, time to put our trust in these fellows and, and share their beautiful work. And uh, just thank you again. And thanks again to our community members for adding your voice. Uh, thank you everyone for your courage, your creativity, your saying yes, and just for showing up here today. Um, I love you. I love this place. I love this gathering and uh, can't wait to see you again. <laughs>